want to welcome you to our last session of the day. We are thrilled to have our speakers with us once again. I just want to go over a few housekeeping notes. Throughout today's session, we do encourage you once again to use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions during these presentations. All other comments can be posted in the chat box. And after this session, I want to remind everyone where you can find information on how to claim your CME credits on the CME and tech support on that webpage. Um, you can use the navigation buttons at the top and you will find information on how to claim your CME. We are very excited to welcome our speakers. And I first want to introduce our research director of the Celiac Disease Center at University of Chicago, um, very renowned um, Dr. Bana Javri, who will be kicking off this session. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you to everybody, and especially thank you to the speakers of this session. Uh, I think you have heard at the beginning uh, of today uh, how much neurological symptoms and pain uh, are part of the celiac disease symptomatology. And I think one issue uh, we have is how do you translate symptoms into uh, mechanisms? Uh, and this is critical because if we want to identify uh, both uh, strategies for prevention and treatment, it is really critical to understand basic mechanisms. And that's why I'm extremely excited for uh, this session because we have uh, an outstanding lineup of speakers who have a strong interest in a mechanistic basis of neurological symptoms. Uh, you may have also seen at the uh, beginning of today that uh, when you think about celiac disease, there's both uh, intestinal symptoms, there are peripheral neurological symptoms, and then there are central nervous and cognitive symptoms. And each of them uh, should be thought about in, in, in probably different ways. But one thing we should also remember is that the gut is a highly inert organ and that uh, understanding the connection between what's happening both in terms of tissue damage, clinical symptoms, and the intestinal nervous system is uh, also very important. So I'm not going to take more time and I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Daniel Musida, who is uh, a full professor since 2021 mm -hmm. uh, at the Rothfeller Institute. And uh, congratulations, Dan, who just got a Howard Hughes Investigator uh, Award, which is highly prestigious. So uh, Daniel Musida uh, trained in Brazil and then in the US. Uh, and he had uh, at, uh, at the very beginning of uh, his training, a very strong interest in immunology and specifically in immune tolerance. Uh, but what has been very striking is also uh, that very early on, as he started as an assistant professor at the Rockefeller Institute he, uh, University, he had uh, an interest in really uh, uh, combining immunology and neurology and, and understanding the connection uh, between uh, the immunological phenomenon and uh, the nervous system. So uh, without further ado, Dan, uh, I'll let you take it from there. And thank you again for having accepted the invitation. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Bana, and thanks for the invitation. It's my pleasure to present here in session uh, before Isaac, another uh, great friend and also amazing scientist that actually I learned a lot from, from him in terms of neuroimmune interactions. And I also should mention that um, I'm deeply inter interested in celiac disease. I was discussing that with uh, Isaac before. And I have to say that uh, everything I learned, or maybe 90% came from uh, Bana's work. So you guys are, are very well served with this director. It's really, um, you know, I, I like to just sit and see what she's doing next. So uh, really my pleasure. Uh, and I think both Isaac and I are, are presenting uh, work that is not directly, uh, you know, working on celiac disease models, but I agree with Bana that this basic understanding of these interactions, for example, Isaac, Isaac in studying TRP, uh, TRP-V1 uh, and pain, uh, also that for sure directly connects to the pathophysiology of celiac disease. And of course, in the manifestation that involve uh, the, the nervous system. Uh, 
So as Bana mentioned, uh, my presentation today will be focused on, on one aspect of the lab that is neuroimmune interactions. Uh, and the work that I'm presenting uh, actually started uh, many years ago uh, with a series of uh, students in the lab, some that already left, some that are outgoing and living now, and some that are arriving, and they, most of them are here listed uh, in this slide, and several collaborators that have really helped us throughout these years, including Isaac, that has been a constant source of, uh, of good advice in this, this topic. So I think Bana mentioned correctly, and, and, and you know, this is the topic of the next two, those two seminars, the, the gut is highly innovated, and this includes innovation that comes from outside and testing. You can see these fibers rich in intestine. This is the ileum of an animal uh, uh, using deep clearing uh, tissue imaging. And you can see these are, of course, uh, fibers that are coming or going uh, from the intestine. And, but also includes, the intestine also includes a large network of neurons that uh, are located within the walls of, of the intestine. And this is sort of the topic of the presentation today. These neurons that are located primarily in two different plexus, the muscularis, myentetic plexus, which is the main plexus of the intestine, and the submucosal plexus, which uh, is also relevant, but has less neurons in terms of number than uh, the myentetic plexus. But overall, the lab is interested in several aspects, um, and in fact, very much like a Banner's lab, on how tissue, the, the, the tissue cells in the intestine uh, communicate uh, with uh, immune cells that are populating the gut. And I, I think we all believe that uh, understanding how these interactions um, influence gut physiology and uh, immunity, it's sort of key in understanding how this uh, process may lead uh, the disruption of this process may lead to, to different diseases in the intestine. So in terms of um, presentation today, the main question that we have asked throughout these past years in the lab is really how uh, populations of neurons and located in the tissue that is so highly stimulated, that is the gut, people call a physiological inflammation, can survive in such an environment which is constantly uh, exposed to microbes that are in vast majority non-pathogenic, uh, like the microbiota, but also exposed to a large amount and diversity of, of pathogens in the gut. So uh, what we found, uh, in fact, uh, reported last year is that uh, commensal bacteria, so the non-pathogenic microbes populated in the gut are influencing both the number as well as the profile uh, the, in terms of functional differen differentiation of enteric neurons. And I'm not going to cover this, um, this, this presentation uh, today. Um, and we also found that manipulation of gut microbiota, for example, with antibiotics, as well as infection of animals uh, with enteric infections, like with salmonella and different types of pathogens, lead to a very quick uh, and profound loss of gut enteric neurons and we found that this loss of enteric neurons is mediated via a non-canonical uh, type of inflammasome that upstream is NRP6 and downstream triggers a form of cell death called paraptosis that is mediated via uh, caspase 11. Um, but the topic is exactly uh, in, this, in this regard uh, in, in, in terms of neuronal loss. And the question that we ask is, uh, if we understand the immune system not only as a source of resistance against pathogen, but also as a source of inflammation that can, that can damage our own tissues, uh, what are the mechanisms in play uh, in the gut that may prevent uh, inflammation-induced tissue damage, uh, so-called disease uh, tolerance? And what we found, uh, just as a summary before even I present the data, is that the a type of immune cells uh, populating the intestinal tissue, particularly the, the muscularis, the outer layer of the intestine called uh, mus uh, muscularis macrophages. They mediate this process of disease tolerance by preventing inflammation-induced neuronal loss. As you can see here, these macrophages in green are wrapping around neuronal cell bodies in the muscularis of the gut. And actually this resembles very much uh, form of immune cells that is present in the brain called the microglia that actually serve 
uh, somewhat similar functions than what we described for these cells in the, in the intestine. So again, um, making a sort of a long story short and presenting the data, uh, summary of the data before I show the study, uh, we found that these macrophages that surround the neurons in the gut, they express high levels of adrenergic receptors, better to adrenergic receptors. And by sensing norepinephrine, which is released by gut projecting sympathetic neurons, they trigger a neuroprotective program. These macrophages trigger a neuroprotective program that mediates neuroprotection via activation of an enzyme arginase 1 that downstream leads to production of polyamines, which are in turn neuroprotective. So, but the question that uh, we had in these initial studies, and I'm gonna show some of this data here, is uh, if all these manipulations, such as antibiotic treatment, as well as enteric infections, lead to such a drastic loss of enteric neurons, what happens when you have successive exposure to pathogens, which is uh, normal in the wild, normal uh, among human populations, particularly in, uh, among uh, people living in developing countries that are exposed to constant uh, types of enteric infections. So what happens if you are exposed to several different types of infections? And we, um, we are adopting the name of this project as the political landscape changes, it used to be called the Trump, uh, project, but now we call this project Bolsonaro. And the basic principle is if you keep losing neurons after even every infection, uh, you know, how low can the neuronal numbers uh, go? So that's actually even a, a rhyme for, for Bolsonaro, uh, really a genocidal president in Brazil. So the way we address this is again looking at different regions of the intestine, something that Banna also is very, uh, uh, is very much interested because the, the intestinal uh, regions are very different from proximal to distal. And uh, what we did was um, to uh, first establish a system of successive infections with different pathogens because we want to study an effect that the infection has in the, in the tissue that does not depend necessarily on immunological memory. So for that, we used, um, a bug called Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, which is um, also a foodborne pathogen that triggers a form of colitis uh, and, inf and, and inflammation in the gut. And it targets the colon as well as the distal intestine in the ileum. And what we did was um, infect animals with this, with this bacteria pathogen, wait for this pathogen to be cleared, to be eliminated from, the, from the, these animals by their own immune responses, and then come with a second infection that uh, presumably, as we knew from the previous work, would also impact via the induction of inflammation in the number of enteric neurons. And then I ask whether uh, exposure to successive infections would trigger, uh, you know, a cumulative loss of enteric neurons. So the first important point um, for the data here is that uh, when we looked and measure the, uh, the clearance of the second bug here, Salmonella. This is a mutant form of Salmonella called spy B that um, leads, uh, uh, leads to a less pathogenic form of, of inflammation because it, it can be cleared in about a week, as you see here, they expose infection. And what we saw is that animals that were infected uh, for the first time with spy B, as well as animals that were infected with spy B that had previously been exposed to another a bacterial infection, Yersinia, they cleared in a very similar way the different bugs. So that is just to demonstrate that the previous infection did not affect the ability of animals to clear the second infection. Therefore, resistance mechanisms were not impacted. So what we did next was to measure a functional redoubt of neuronal activity in the intestine. And that is a main way of doing that is measure the gut motility, the peristalsis, or the total transit time, the time that takes for food to be ingested containing a dye. So for this dye to appear in the feces of, the, in the feces of these animals. And then what we saw is that as we had previously described, a single infection with spy B salmonella leads to a delay in gut motility, 
and that is because a single infection triggers loss of enteric neurons that is very long um, uh, term loss. However, if these animals were previously infected with another pathogen, Yersinia, this uh, delayed gut motility was prevented, suggesting a beneficial effect for the host if a uh, previous infection occurred before this uh, uh, salmonella infection. And that is a definition, what I just said, of disease tolerance. So there was disease tolerance being induced by an infection uh, via the oral route. So what we did next is quite obvious uh, in our lab. We measure the number of neurons present in the gut uh, before and after this exposure. So in the ileum, which is data showing here, ileum myenteric plexus, we have you know, roughly 400 to 450 neurons per square millimeter in a non-infected animal. The Yersinia infection leads to a, some loss of enteric neurons, which is less drastic than the loss induced by spy B or Salmonella uh, infection. So Yersinia is about 15 to 20 percent loss. I spy B, it's about 25 to 30 percent loss of enteric neurons in this region. However, if the animals were exposed to Yersinia, clear this pathogen, then come with a spy B, there was no cumulative loss of neurons, suggesting again the induction of disease tolerance and that prevents the, 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 the cumulative loss of enteric neurons. So in the past, and I showed this in the summary of this presentation, we found that these muscularis macrophages that surround the neurons in the gut, they mediate this disease tolerance. So they, they, they perform a neuroprotective function uh, in infection so that if you uh, target these macrophages, the loss of neurons is aggravated. And if you trigger the function, you can prevent the loss of, of enteric neurons. That is in the primary infection. So what happens in the, sec in the successive heterologous infections? So what we saw, uh, as you can see here, this is the number of infection, uh, number of neurons in different conditions. And what we did was a pretty simple experiment. So we infected two different groups this late, there's last two groups here with Yersinia, which we saw that induces uh, uh, protection of neuronal loss. And then in one group, we treated with uh, vehicle control and then infected with SPIB. As we saw before, there were no uh, additional loss of enteric neurons. In the second group, we deleted, we depleted macrophages, exactly this macrophage that surround these neurons, by providing an antibody, anti CSF receptor uh, or MCSF. And because these macrophages are very uh, sensitive, they, they really require this MCSF signaling. This leads to loss of these macrophages. And if you, if you lose these macrophages after the initial infection, and then you come with a spy B, the salmonella secondary infection, then you see a loss of enteric neurons, suggesting that in this model of successive infections, these macrophages are essential in providing uh, and this uh, protection of the neurons. Finally, uh, in terms of mechanisms, I mentioned also in the summary that the expression of beta-2 adrenergic receptor by macrophages is essential in inducing this neuroprotective program in these cells. So what we did was the same thing. We infected two different groups with Yersinia. And then in one group, these animals lack the expression of the energy receptor in the myeloid compartment, the genetic targeting of adrenergic beta 2 adrenergic receptors. And if they lack adrenergic receptors and you come with a spy B, then you see again this uh, secondary loss of neurons upon infection, suggesting that what we had described for the primary uh, immune response occurs also in the long term in successive infection, which is. Uh, yes, senior infection triggers, and I didn't show this data, but we observed, triggers the activation of gut-projecting sympathetic neurons that release norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is sensed by these macrophages that surround the neurons, the muscularis macrophages. They upregulate arginase 1, and that induces neuronal protection via release of polyamines. So that is a mechanism of condition tolerance induced by successive infection. So, the next questions we had, uh, the next question we had was to address whether a different type of pathogen, and we focus on on helminths. 
uh, could induce the same type of, of protection. And the reason we decided to study helmets, uh, it's several fold. One of them is that helmets have been living with mammals over millions of years. So they are very adapted to, the, uh, to live in the, in the mammals, within the mammals, without causing really a destruction of the tissue. They induce a type of immune response that is very distinct from the immune response induced by uh, Yersinia or Salmonella. It's a type two immunity that resembles what happens during allergies. An additional aspect is that the helminths, and particularly this one that we chose to use in this model, the Strongyloides venus valensis, uh, are particularly uh, restricted to a very distal side of the infection of the of the infection that uh, the Salmonella is affecting. So. The, this helmet is targeting the duodenum, the very proximal part of the gut. And in a work that we published um, actually from um, uh, assistant professor in Chicago, uh, that is colleague of Banajabi, that Esther has, we showed that these helmets are not even uh, present in the proximal jejunum. So they are really restricted to the proximal part of the gut, therefore very far from the region that is, that is affected by salmonella infection. So the model was the same. We infected with this helmet that leads to a, a temporary infection that is cleared in about two weeks. We counted the number of worms, waited for the clearance, then come with a second infection of salmonella. And what we observed is that very similar to what we observed with the infection with Yersinia, the previous infection with the helmet did not affect the ability of the animals to clear the salmonella infection. Therefore, again, resistance uh, against salmonella was maintained, was as very similar. What happens in terms of functional consequences? So first, just to point that we observe a very similar protection. So in terms of transit time delay that is induced by uh, salmonella infection, the previous infection with the helmet prevented gut motility changes. And one thing we added, in these studies here was to use like, these clams cages, metabolic cages to measure the NH balance in these animals. And we measure several different parameters, but in a, in a kind of a summary, what we observed is that animals that were infected with the helmet before uh, the salmonella infection maintain the steady state energy balance as opposed to animals that were infected with spy B and lost enteric nerves that seem to consume more uh, calories without gaining more weight, suggesting that they have a defective absorption of nutrients in the gut. Therefore, uh, in a different set of measures, the infection with a helmet prior to the infection of salmonella prevented several parameters that are associated with a gut, uh, gut uh, pathology uh, in this model. What happens with the number of uh, enteric neurons Again, just to show that salmonella, as I showed before, induces loss of enteric neurons in the myenteric plexus. However, if animals are exposed to helmet prior to the infection of salmonella, there was no loss whatsoever. So that's different than the Yersinia model. The helmet not only did not lose, induce any loss, but also completely prevented neurons from dying. In terms of mechanisms, again, we saw that macrophages that surround these neurons are necessary. So if deplete macrophages after the infection with the worm and then come with the salmonella infection, salmonella will induce identical loss of, of enteric neurons. And the last was a surprise for us. We saw that in this model, absence of adrenergic signaling in the macrophages did not matter. So the infection with the helmet was protective even in the animals that did not have adrenergic receptor expression in the macrophages, suggesting that helmets were inducing a different mechanism of, of disease tolerance via macrophages, but that did not depend on the expression of adrenergic receptor. So what is the mechanism? I have uh, about four, five more minutes to, to end, and I'm going to show the summary of the mechanisms here and try to walk through what we found. So as I said, helminths induce a different type of immune response than what is observed uh, against in bacterial infections is a type two immunity similar to allergy. And we found that CD4 T cells that secrete IL-5, a cytokine that induces recruitment of different types of innate immune cells. And we found particularly eosinophils, which are, are recruiting large uh, numbers to the gut upon helminth infection are essential 
in modulating this neuroprotective function of the macrophages via secretion of the cytokines IL-4, IL-13. So as uh, again, summary for what we found, eosinophils that are recruited in one side of the intestine, the duodenum, secrete large amounts of IL-4, IL-13 that circulates uh, and reaches uh, macrophages in the ileum and induce uh, protection against uh, successive infections. So just a few examples of these demonstrations that uh, we had here. One is the number of eosinophils. You see that uh, already at steady state is high number of eosinophils in the intestine, about 40% of 30% of all hematopoietic cells in the lumina propria are eosinophils. That's much less in the ileum. So in the proximal and small intestine, there's something in the tissue that is more prone to host eosinophils. But the infection with the helmet induces a really large accumulation of eosinophils in the lumina propria. You see it's about 80, 70% of all hematopoietic cells are eosinophils as opposed to 10 to 15% in the ileum. And we found additionally that eosinophils that are in the duodenum of infected animals express higher levels of IL-4 during the infection than eosinophils that are in distal site of the infection in the ileum. Additionally, we, uh, we addressed how long this protection lasts and we saw uh, protection from three to six months after the initial infection with the helmet. And that coincided mostly with the how long with how long the, pre the presence of eosinophils was noted in the gut post infection. So you see, three months we still see, we still observe an increased number of eosinophils uh, in the duodenum. Um, and as I said, this correlates with uh, protection of uh, neuronal loss. So if you if you expose the animal that was infected with the helmet three months before to Salmonella. Still, they do not show any loss of enteric neurons, and this protection is lost almost entirely about six months post the initial infection. What happens if you transfer eosinophils from animal to a, a naive animal? We transfer the eosinophils from different sites to a naive animal and expose the host mice to the salmonella infection. And what we saw is that uh, a dose dependent protection by eosinophils from the ileum. Uh, I'm sorry, eosinophils from the duodenum, preventing loss of neurons in the ileum, as opposed to eosinophils from the ileum that did not induce any protection from the successive infection with the, with the salmonella. So this showed that, again, a function transfer of eosinophils induces protection from neuronal loss. Next, we did the loss of function strategy, which is a DT-based eosinophil depletion. Uh, so as animals express a diphtheria toxin receptor, in the eosinophils. So if you provide the diphtheria toxin, you selectively target eosinophils. And if you, uh, and the other strategy was to maintain the number of eosinophils, but target their ability of secreting IL-4, IL-13. And in both cases, if eosinophils are not present after the infection with the worm, or if the eosinophils are not able to secrete uh, these cytokines, there is um, loss of protection from the neuronal uh, uh, loss induced by the secondary uh, salmonella infection. And as in terms of mechanisms here, you can see that the, the expression of this arginase one, which mediates this uh, neuroprotective phenotype in the macrophage is lost if the eosinophils are not there or if the eosinophils are not able to secrete IL-4, IL-13. So I think I will show the last data slide and conclude to end on time. So the question that um, uh, Tomas asked here, Tomas Arens, the postdoc who uh, did this work, uh, asked is uh, what is sufficient in terms of inducing this neuroprotective eosinophils in terms of infection? Um, so the protection, the eosinophils, of course, as all hematopoietic cells are induced in the bone marrow, and what we saw is that bone marrow precursors were increased in the ability to, to, to differentiate into eosinophils several weeks and you know up to eight weeks after the infection, showing that there is a restructuring of the bone marrow differentiation that is long lasting. So we ask whether this is sufficient to induce neural protection by transferring these bone marrow precursors from a naive animal or from an animal that was previously infected with this worm. So activated precursors or naive precursors. 
and then transfer the sublittery radiated host mice then infected with, with the salmonella. In this case, neither groups showed protection, suggesting that this primed bone marrow precursor was not sufficient to induce neuroprotection. However, when we did a similar experiment, uh, but we transferred these precursors from an animal that was previously infected or not with the worm, we showed, we observed neuroprotection, suggesting that the host tissue must be primed very likely in the duodenum in order to allow for this differentiation of a neuroprotective eosinophil that secrete high levels of IL-4, IL-13. So I will conclude here. I already showed both uh, mechanisms here, one induced by bacterial infection, the second induced by helminths that induce very similar in terms of gene expression profile, neuroprotective macrophages that prevent loss of neurons in successive infection. I'm gonna end here with an image of a last week Puerto Rico retreat of the lab. So, you know, it was good to, to have some time of relax with the lab, everybody uh, here in the lab. And again, thank everybody that did this work and collaborators, but uh, particularly uh, Tomas, uh, who is somewhere here. Uh, Tomas actually didn't go to this retreat. Tomas and Fanny, who did, uh, you know, a lot of this work and Begun and Zach, who have also helped. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dan. I, I think it's kind of fascinating to think about how infection can uh, alter the uh, neurons and destroy or protect neurons. And maybe we can discuss during the Q&A what you think about sterile inflammation and non-infection uh, in that context that could be related to celiac disease. So our next speaker is uh, Isaac Chu. So uh, I'm really delighted to welcome Isaac. He's an associate professor uh, uh, at Harvard uh, School of Medicine. Uh, he has done tremendous work on uh, pain and on the analysis of uh, nociceptors, and he has developed a strong interest in how uh, immunological signals uh, can uh, impact uh, nociceptors and their responses. And more recently, he uh, has also an interest in understanding the, the neuroimmune connection with barrier function. So, uh, Isaac. Thank you so much, Bana, for this opportunity. And it's a really pleasure learning today about celiac disease and, and also to follow uh, Dan Rosita, who's one of my role models. And I learned so much from Dan. And, um, you know, he's really the pioneer in the gut. Uh, neuroimmune field. So it's an honor to go uh, after him. And just to continue that theme, we think the nervous system uh, that innervates the GI tract is critical in uh, controlling uh, immune function. And there's crosstalk between microbes and neurons and immune cells. And that's really a, a theme of my lab. We particularly are interested in nociceptor neurons. So I'm going to, uh, these are my disclosures. Okay, so nociceptor neurons, uh, actually are a subset of them called CGRP neurons are labeled in red here. And you can see the really amazing network of fibers, kind of like what Dan was showing for enteric neurons and other neurons that are just juxtaposed to the epithelial cells here labeled in green of the gut. So we think there must be intimate crosstalk bidirectionally between these two cell types. And in barrier protection, I think this is a, a important area um, that is uh, of investigation. So what are nociceptors? So nociceptors, this term was coined by Charles Sherrington uh, in 1906. He is the, one of the you know, fathers of modern neuroscience and he described the neural reflex, uh, the prototypic one mediated by nociceptors that mediate pain. So he described there must be a neural reflex, sensory motor reflex that causes um, protection from noxious stimuli. So he coined these, uh, he said that these are nociceptors. And I think this principle of nociception is uh, interesting in parallel with also immunity in terms of protection from potentially damaging um, stimuli. So you get a sens sensory neuron, a sensory afferent that detects a noxious stimuli, which then leads to a withdrawal response through the motor system. And other examples of nociception include not just pain, but also nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And I think these are 
you know, features of uh, GI disorders. Uh, so what is the role of, of the nociception or pain is to protect from danger? And we know that nociceptor neurons have molecular sensors for different noxious stimuli, including noxious heat, uh, TRIP-V1, which uh, Dan uh, referred to earlier as an ion channel that detects uh, heat. And then there's also um, sensors like TRIP-A1, which detects electrophiles, reactive chemicals. Uh, there are many receptors on these neurons for uh, uh, for um, uh, injury-induced uh, damage associated molecular patterns like ATP. Also, there's piezos, uh, which sense force. And uh, also, we think these neurons are able to directly sense pathogens and microbes. And that's one of the themes of our lab is we're trying to understand how these nerves detect uh, microbes. And um, this is a growing area of research that we found and others that the nerves terminals of nociceptors can directly detect bacterial products. So from gram-positive bacteria such as Streptopyogenes and Staph aureus, we've identified uh, streptolysin S, alpha hemolysin, and other pore-forming toxins like gamma hemolysin that can form a pore in the membrane of the pain fiber, and then you get an action potential and transduction of pain. We also have gram-negative pathogens that can sensitize these neurons through LPS and flagellin. And uh, also beyond bacterial pathogens, Canada has been found to activate neurons through zymosan. So these neurons can sense microbes, uh, especially pathogens, but also we think they can also potentially sense uh, commensal microbes from the gut. Uh, so this is work from Nissan Yisikar, who is a postdoc in Christoph Benoit and Diane Mathis's lab. And this is actually calcium imaging data we had um, published a few years ago with dorsal ganglia neurons, which include nociceptors. And Nissan uh, apply different human gut commensal microbes and subsets of them, such as the B. ovatus or C. ramosum, are inducing calcium influx in uh, these neurons. So they could sense potentially products from uh, gut commensal microbes as well. Now, uh, this was mentioned earlier that pain is a major a component of GI disorders, including celiac disease. Uh, other ones include IBS, IBD, and enteric pathogen infections. Uh, so there, you know, we think that part of this is driven by microbial products and also barrier dysfunction. Uh, but one of the questions we wanna know is, are nociceptors also impacting or controlling the gut barrier, uh, feeding back to the gut? And so one of the key questions in this axis is whether neurons communicate directly with gut epithelial cells. And uh, so the first evidence that we have from this was work that was done by Nikki Lai, my first graduate student actually, who a uh, really talented graduate student. And she uh, was interested in whether um, nociceptors regulate enteric infections. And so she was studying um, she found an interaction in the small intestine and specifically in the Peyer's patches. And this was in the context of salmonella infection. So, uh, but more generally, how do we target nociceptors and innervate the gut? So there are two subtypes of nociceptors uh, for that, that are extrinsic neurons that innervate the gut. Ones that reside within the vagus nerve and they're in the nodose jugular ganglia. And they express the ion channels NAV1.8 and TRIP-B1. And these take signals from the upper GI tract of the brainstem and you get vagal reflexes that include potentially vomiting and nausea. And then you have the dorsal ganglia neurons which innervate the, the gut and go to the spinal cord. And these also express these uh, two characteristic ion channels and they mediate pain, visceral pain. So um, Nick, Nikki was able to use genetic tools to target NAV1.8 and trip b one expressing uh, neurons and see the consequences on infection. So the first experiment she did was she took NAV1.8 Cre crossed with diphtheria toxin uh, expressing mice. So these will ablate NAV1.8 lineage neurons, which include nociceptors. Uh, and then so the Cre positive mice lack nociceptors and Cre negative mice are control litter mates. And she infected them orally with salmonella 
and then looked at day one post-infection and day five post-infection at bacterial recovery in the small intestine ileum, pyrus patch, and then the spread to the liver. And what you could see is that nociceptor ablation led to significantly more bacterial invasion of the small intestine and also spread. And this was accompanied by worse weight loss. So nociceptors are important for controlling host defense against salmonella. In a parallel approach, Nikki also targeted trpv one expressing neurons using a trpv one DTR mouse. So here you can ablate neurons that express trpv one trpv one is the ion channel that detects noxious heat. Uh, capsaicin, which is the active ingredient in chili peppers that causes the, um, the pain sensation and also low pH. And so this phenocopy, the NAV 1.8 ablation approach, where uh, lacking trpv one neurons made mine more susceptible to salmonella infection. And Nikki found logs fold more bacterial invasion of the ileum, the pyres patch, and also a spread to the liver. So it turns out that the way that nociceptors were controlling this infection was by interaction with a specialized epithelial cell type called M cells or microfold cells. And these microfold cells sit on top of the pyres patch. Pyres patch is a specialized lymphoid organ in the, in the small intestines. And the M cells are on top of the follicle-associated epithelium, and they, they are called that because of these microfolds on their surface. And they're very important cells because they sample antigens from the lumen of the gut, which then are taken up by antigen-presenting cells. But they're also exploited by pathogens, including salmonella, to enter into and invade, and they translocate across the M cells. And what we found was that these neurons were actually interacting with these epithelial cells. So this is actually an image um, taken of the Pyrus patch dome where we stained for nerve fibers in TUG1 and GP2, which is um, glycoprotein 2 expressed on mature M cells. Uh, you could see them closely juxtaposed to each other and Salmonella actually binds to GP2 for its invasion using its fimbri. So could these neurons interact with the M cells or, or regulate them? And it turns out they do. So if we looked at M cell density, uh, this is actually prior to infection. In the NAV1.8 DTA or trp one DTR mice, you could see the M cells, which are in green here, increase in number. So, so this is per follicle and average per mouse. So neurons are required to control or suppress the numbers of these M cells, which are critical entry points for the pathogens. So we think that this is an important way of controlling gut homeostasis and also host defense. Uh, so we turned out to find that the mechanism of this control is through a neuropeptide that the nociceptor is released called CGRP. So CGRP actually suppressed M cell numbers. And also this was beneficial in a second way because um, a protective microbe in the small intestine called segmented filamentous bacteria actually protects against salmonella and they cannot attach to M cells very well. So by decreasing the numbers of M cells, there are actually more SFB on the pyrus patch dome, and this further protected against salmonella. So you shut out the gates of entry and also increase the, the microbiome um, density to help with protection. So this is in the small intestine, and this is published work. So I'm gonna now tell you about unpublished data, which we're excited about, which is the role of nociceptors in controlling a goblet cell function, a mucus barrier function. And this is work by Da Ping Yang, uh, uh, talented postdoc in the lab. It was started by Amanda Jacobson, another postdoc in the lab. So we got interested in this uh, because we were looking at a key uh, um, part of the barrier, which is mucus levels. Uh, so looking in the colon where there are two mucus layers and staining here uh, in green mucus with MUC2, we found that the nociceptor deficient mice actually had thinner mucus layers. You can see that here. And this is quantified, um, this is average per mouse. So at baseline, nociceptors are, seem to be maintaining colonic mucus levels. And we could also measure that by using this bead assay or we could put a fluorescent beads on top of the mucus layer and then measure the distance to the epithelial. And we could see that there's a thinner uh, mucus layer. Now, uh, mucus and goblet cells are critical for barrier protection. So goblet cells are the cell type that secretes mu mucins, and the large intestine has two, an outer and inner mucus layer, and, and small intestine, uh, one mucus layer. And these mucins are critical for keeping the microbiome 
at bay from, from, from the epithelial surface and also uh, for maintaining uh, mucosal homeostasis in other ways. So um, we were wondering, could the neurons be communicating to goblet cells? And so if we looked and stained for goblet cells here, actually with the MUC2, um, and then stained for uh, nociceptors using this CGRP GFP mouse, what we found was that the, the CGRP positive neurons were very closely uh, juxtaposed uh, contacting uh, goblet cells. So, um, so this is another way of staining for goblet cells uh, with this UEA1, which stains for mature goblet cells. We also saw a lot of nerve fibers directly juxtaposed to these goblet cells. So um, I, I refer to this neuropeptide CGRP. So when neurons, nociceptors are activated or pain is produced, the, this neuropeptide, which is stored in the peripheral terminals of the nociceptor, immediately comes out because of calcium influx. And then it binds to its receptor called RAMP1, which forms a complex with CalcRL. And this is a GPCR signal that induces um, cyclic AMP increase. Now, CGRP signaling is very important for pain production. In fact, CGRP antagonists are very effective to treat migraine and headache. So we want to ask, uh, is RAMP1 expressed in the gut epithelial cells? And if you look across single cell transcriptome databases for gut epithelial cell types, RAMP1 seems to be exquisitely and highly expressed in goblet cells. So this is um, from small intestinal data sets and also from colonic data sets suggesting that CGRP could be talking to goblet cells. So we confirmed this uh, by RNA scope analysis. Here you can see RAMP1 and MUC2. So MUC2 stains goblet cells and RAMP1 is basically expressed in all uh, goblet cells that we can see here in the colon. So then we looked at CGRP deficient mice. So Calc A, which encodes CGRP alpha isoform is the main one expressed by nociceptors. And what you could see here is the Calc A knockout mice had thinner mucus uh, thickness compared to, and also heads are kind of intermediate compared to wild type. Um, and then uh, we made a uh, specific ramp one conditional knockout using Villancre. So this will knock out the receptor for CGRP ramp one in gut epithelial cells. And you can see here, the mucus thickness is also significantly less. Uh, so we think ramp one signaling is involved in maintaining mucus levels. Then we also did an experiment, which is quite interesting. If you inject CGRP into mice exogenously, and then look within five minutes of injection at uh, mucus, you could see a rapid uh, increase in mucus thickness. So CGRP injection is able to induce mucus uh, increase. So what I've shown you so far of the second part is that nociceptors are important for maintaining the mucus layers. And also I didn't show you data on goblet cell maturation. Uh, RAMP1 is expressed on goblet cells and maintains mucus production. So can neuronal activation promote mucus production? So to answer this question, Daping used chemogenetics. So chemogenetics is an approach where you can express um, synth uh, these designer GPCRs, which are only able to bind to a synthetic ligand uh, that's not found uh, endogenously called CNO. So then we express these uh, dreads, activating dreads under promoters that are nociceptive, and then we gave the mice CNO and see what happens. So here we're expressing the dread under a NAV1.8 Cre, which marks sensory neurons. And then we gave the mice CNO injected IP, and then again, looked five minutes post-injection. And here we're staining for goblet cells using PAS AB pass staining. And looking at the goblet cells, you can see immediately that the goblet cells empty. So you can see they're losing their mucus staining. Uh, and we think this is a, you know, uh, induced by the neuron activation. Similarly, we use the CGRP Cre mouse here, Calc A Cre dread and we treated the mice with CNO. In this case, we pre-treated the mice either with vehicle control or BIBN4096, which is a RAMP1 inhibitor. And you could see that uh, CNO treatment induces rapid goblet cell emptying, and then BIBN can inhibit that induction of goblet cell emptying. So uh, finally, to uh, prove again that mucus is increased by this neuronal activation. We also measured 
uh, Mach 2 thickness, and you can see that uh, within five minutes of CNO injection, there's a rapid increase in mucus uh, thickness in the colon. Okay, so neuronal activation promotes goblet cell emptying and mucus production. So what is the physiological function of this axis? So to test that, we looked at uh, DSS colitis, where you can give the mice DSS, which can damage, which damages the gut barrier, and then causes inflammation. And what we found was that neurons that lack nociceptors and have one point in creatine DTA mice were more susceptible to DSS colitis. So this is looking at body weight loss and also looking at colon length. And then finally looking at um, pathology using HNE staining and AB pass staining, where you could see the nociceptor deficient mice has more severe inflammation and also loss of goblet cells, as you can see here. So um, what, if, what could explain that? Well, one thing is that we think that actually there's dysbiosis that occurs because if we looked at uh, microbiome analysis of the feces from these NAV1.8 DTA mice versus control mice, there's a dysregulation where there's an increase in two bacteria, Turicobacter and Allobaculum, which actually have been linked to uh, colitis before. So it could be that now the lacking the mucus could lead to dysbiosis, which then promotes uh, colitis. Um, we also saw that in the mice that lacked RAMP1, specifically in the epithelial cells, the villain RAMP1 um, uh, conditional knockout mice, they were more susceptible to DSS colitis, where you can see here with body increased body weight loss and a shortening of the colon length. So then we asked is, uh, can we protect the mice by giving them CGRP? So what Da Ping did here was he took the NAV1.8 DTA mice and then implanted a pump to deliver either PBS or CGRP during the DSS colitis. So you can see here that NAV1.8 DTA treated with PBS were more susceptible to colitis than control mice, but then uh, it treated with CGRP can restore protection. And this is also true for looking at the colon length and also looking at pathology. So in the second part, what I've shown you here is that we think there's a goblet cell neuron axis where the neurons produce CGRP, which induces rapid release of mucus from goblet cells via RAMP1. And this is important for um, mucus production and also protection uh, from colitis. So in summary, what I've shown you here is that we think nociceptors are very important for controlling um, the gut epithelial barrier protection. Uh, on the one hand, they can directly sense microbes to produce pain, uh, and, and also they release neuropeptides that can regulate the epithelial cells. So in the small intestine, the nociceptors regulate pyrus patch M cells in the gut microbiome to protect against salmonella infection. And in the colon, the CGRP-expressing nociceptors signal to goblet cells via CGRP ramp one axis to regulate mucus production and barrier protection from colitis. So understanding how neurons signal to gut cells may result in better treatments for pain and inflammation. And uh, again, I just wanted to thank, you know, the really talented folks in my lab who did this work. Uh, the first part was all done by um, my first graduate student, Nikki Lai. Um, and then the second part was a collaboration between Da Ping Yang, Amanda Jacobson, and also with help from Kim Mearshart. And we had a lot of help from collaborators, including uh, Clifford Wolf, who taught me all about pain, uh, Krista Benoit, Diane Mathis, Mina Rao, Jun Hu uh, on the first part on Salmonella. And then for the second part on the goblet cell work, it's, uh, it's been in collaboration with Dennis Casper. And also, as I mentioned, I learned a lot from Daniel. Uh, but also we got help from Jay Thiagaraja, Malin Johansson, and, and we're also getting help from Bana Jabri and Sam Riesenfeld, uh, who's actually helping us now with some transcriptional analysis of the goblet cells. So with that, I wanted to thank you all for, for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Isaac. And again, we're going to have the Q&A discussion because I think that there's a lot to discuss about the uh, mm -hmm. relationship of you know, C-receptors and also inflammation and pain and, and the immune barrier. So I just want in a few words to introduce my co-moderator, Joseph Murray, who is a professor at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Joe in the city actually doesn't need any introduction. He has done uh, seminar work and he has been highly involved in the development of clinical trials and also uh, really understanding uh, the effect uh, of gluten on the intestinal mucosa. So because of 
time, I'm not going to uh, say more. And Joe, I'll let you take over now the session. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bana. And indeed, it's a pleasure and exciting to be in the midst of this session of, of hard science. I, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Keith Yoder, a senior research analyst in cognitive, the social cognitive neuroscience at the University of Chicago. And he is going to talk to us about what MRI can tell us about behavior. He re received his PhD in psychology from the University of Chicago, and he studies psychological and neural mechanisms underlying socio-emotional socio processing. And his work focuses on how dispositional concern for others and moral values impact social decision-making and how these factors alter functioning within neural networks that support social cognition reward processing and saliency. Possible things that sound to me like we could have great deficiencies of them at this current time. And Dr. Yoder, over to you. Thank you very much for the, the, the nice introduction and uh, thanks again to Bana for inviting me to come and sort of close us out here. Um, as you will have heard from the introduction, um, I have kind of a, a, a different uh, lens through which I study um, science. Um, my talk today is going to focus on what MRI can tell us about behavior. Um, my background is in psychology. Uh, that's what my PhD is in. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, so I thought before I launch into kind of what MRI can tell us, I would do sort of a, a very brief crash course on what MRI is on the assumption that since we've been talking about um, what might be a, considered a low level of analysis, where we're looking at cell signaling within specific neurons and different types of cells, we're going to be looking at a much, uh, many, many coordinated neurons uh, acting together. Um, so this is a picture of an MRI. This is the same model that I've used a lot at the University of Chicago. Um, so magnetic resonance imaging, you probably are a little familiar with. We use strong magnetic fields to induce um, different kinds of tissues to align with those magnetic fields. And then we can use radio frequency pulses to take advantage of the fact that different tissue types have different magnetic properties. And so we can extract spatial information from those. So here on the right are two examples of some MRI images that we might pull out. Um, these are what we would call structural scans because we're pulling out the structure. And then we can do a little bit of pre-processing and render these in 3D to get important spatial information. So one of the things that structural MRI can be very useful for is identifying structural abnormalities. So here on the left is an example of a tumor that you might see. Um, here on the right is an example of inflammatory demyelinating lesions. Um, so if you've been here all day, um, you heard Dr. Leffler at the beginning talk about um, these are some of the central nervous consequences that um, sometimes show up um, in individuals who have celiac disease. Um, but another kind of structural abnormality that he also talked about is white matter integrity. So these are diffusion tensor images where uh, we can again use magnetic properties of water to examine how water can flow in restricted or unrestricted patterns throughout the brain and relate these to either patients compared to controls or a specific symptom level within patients. Um, what my work tends to focus on, though, is what we would call functional MRI. So functional MRI looks at functioning in the central nervous system by taking advantage of neurovascular coupling. Um, so uh, these are sort of two cartoon drawings of the physical system where we have neurons and interneurons along with these glial cells, astrocytes, which form a very tight matrix to hold everything close together. The key point uh, for what my work does is these um, parasites that are on capillary bodies. And so as neurons become more metabolically active because they are uh, doing the work of sending action potentials, receiving postsynaptic excitatory potentials or inhibitory potentials. Um, they can use these inner neurons to send signals to the capillaries, and the capillaries will dilate or constrict depending on local metabolic needs of the neurons. So the reason we care about this is that it turns out if we look at our red blood cells, the hemoglobin can either be carrying oxygen and be loaded or unloaded. Um, deoxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic, whereas oxyhemoglobin is diamagnetic. And so we can take advantage of that using these powerful magnetic signals in MRI to get what's called the blood oxygen level dependent signal 
So the bold signal peaks five to 10 seconds after the nearby neurons become metabolically active. And we can look at this ratio on the scale of seconds um, to zoom in and examine which regions of the cortex and subcortical regions are being metabolically activated. So there's two broad types of functional MRI. Um, and again, as if you were here again from the beginning, Dr. Kupler talked about a new project that we're just starting in collaboration with Dr. Jobri, where we're going to be using um, these two kinds of functional MRI to try to get at some of the neural mechanisms underlying brain fog. Um, one of these is task-based. So task-based MRI uses experimental manipulations to elicit specific changes in activity. So here we have uh, an example summary statistic from a study where individuals were doing a reaction time task. And then we can ask questions about which regions are involved in these processes. So for instance, this region here, as neural signal increases, reaction time slows. So using those inf that information, we can then specifically design studies that we think will tease apart specific cognitive mechanisms. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these task-based versus resting state in a second, but I just want to introduce you to these two broad types of fMRI. The second type is called resting state, where here we don't do any experimental manipulations. Um, the standard measure is ask someone to lie down in a scanner and close their eyes but not fall asleep. So these are task-free fluctuations. We're interested here in the functional dynamics, so the extent to which distributed networks increase and decrease oxygenated signal at the same time. Um, and this resting state connectivity has been going on long enough that we have some pretty well-defined networks now, the, the frontal parietal network, which is involved in executive functioning and a lot of attentional control, as opposed to the default mode network, which is more active during rest often rather than during task. It's important for autobiographic memory. And so we know a lot about how these networks operate in sort of healthy, typically developing individuals. And then we can ask questions about how those networks then operate in individuals with sort of different systems levels or patients compared to controls. So task-based MRI, um, like I said, involves experimental manipulations. Uh, well, one of the things we have to do with MRI is we're always comparing two conditions. It's a contrastive analysis. So um, what we're often looking for is we have one condition, maybe an easy condition and a hard condition, and we look at the bold signal in one condition and compare it to the other. So we're looking for regions that are more active during one condition than another. Um, and this is a really powerful tool because cognitive neuroscience has been going on for a while now. And so we can integrate information from lesion studies and non-human animal work and um, functional MRI scans where we use specific cognitive tasks. And so there's a really well-defined network of regions that play important roles in what we might call socio-emotional decision-making. So this includes sort of core reward processing regions like the striatum and ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which are largely separable from regions that are important for saliency processing, the insula, dorsal anterior cingulate. We also have regions that play an important role for integrating all of these together, which are more central regions of the anterior cingulate. Um, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex in context is important for applying rules, also for what we term executive functioning abilities, so working memory, staying on task, task switching, and these all um, are coordinated with the posterior superior temporal sulcus or temporal parietal junction to integrate social cognition and things like mental state understanding. Um, so I want to give you sort of an example of how, how these tasks actually work. So one of the classical tasks that we use is the flanker task. So here are two example stimuli. So we might start with the, this first one. Your job is to say which direction this central arrow is pointing. So these are fairly easy. This top one is pointing to the right. This bottom one is pointing to the left. These are congruent trials because the two flankers are helpful. So these would be incongruent trials. And it shouldn't be surprising. We're all a little bit slower to say that this one is pointing right when the flankers are incongruent and this one is pointing left. Another really classic test is the Stroop task. So your job here is to say the colors of the letters. So here we have red, green, blue, blue, green, red. This is very easy, but we can make it harder and have this incongruency where now we need to say blue and inhibit our response to say red or say green and inhibit our response to say red. And we can tease these different colors around and differentiate them between congruent and incongruent conditions. So 
what fMRI can add to this question is different kinds of component processes. So if we just have behavior from, for instance, a Stroop test, we can see whether one group might have more errors or might have slower reaction times on average. But with fMRI, if we distinguish between maybe congruent and incongruent trials, we can break down these decision-making processes into distinct components. So for instance, individuals might have more errors or be slower with their response times because there are problems really early on in the processing pipeline. So we can look for visual cortex and see are there sensory encoding difficulties. It might be slightly later where we have to inhibit the letter color or inhibit the word, and that's where the anterior cingulate is very important. Similarly, reaction time might slow down because there are difficulties initiating motor responses. So the supplementary motor area and the primary motor cortex are very important regions here. And finally, there may be totally intact sensory processing, inhibition may be working, initiating the motor response may be fine, but there may be other things that make it difficult to attend to the task at hand, and that's where dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is a very helpful tool, or a very helpful region to invest in. So fMRI with these kinds of tasks has been previously used in other sorts of disorders, so comparing general performance, this is one of the first examples back in 1999. Bush et al. compared healthy controls to individuals with ADHD and showed these very disparate patterns comparing congruent Stroop trials to incongruent Stroop trials to get a sense of what neural mechanisms, what psychological processes might be implicated in explaining differences in how these participants experience the task. So another version of the Stroop task, though, that we're interested in adapting going forward is what's called the emotional Stroop task, where, again, your job is to say the color of the words, but now we have neutral blocks where there's words that aren't necessarily emotional in any context or other words that are evocative, so things like kill or murder. And it turns out that most people are slower responding to this emotional block, and we can then examine which systems are important for encoding this emotional information and does the emotional information lead to slower reaction times because of processes involved in initiating motor responses, staying on task, or affective encoding, such as in the amygdala or uh, cingulate. So to sum up the first kind of fMRI that we can use, task-based fMRI, this allows us to assess neural activity within distinct regions that are associated with distinct component processes during specific cognitive tasks. There's a lot of qualifiers there, the distinct, distinct, and specific, because that's what we, we want to be really careful. We now know enough to use well-developed tasks, well-developed protocols to contextualize what we're doing. Um, and again, I think Dr. Leffler did a great job in the talk this morning about leveraging what we know now about these well-established relatively easy to implement cognitive tasks to really go in and start looking at online neural processing, online behavioral responses um, in patients to understand where are things breaking down, not just people's general sense of, of their experience, but looking at how these different systems are operating. Um, so again, task-based fMRI then can allow us to identify specific systems that are impacted by these experimental manipulations, where experimental Experimental manipulations can be randomly controlled gluten challenge in the case of celiac disease. This then allows us to quantify the relationship between self-reported experiences and changes in neural responses. And we can also easily integrate things uh, like looking at cytokine release or other kinds of metabolites. So the other kind of functional MRI that we can use to get some insight into mechanisms is resting state fMRI. So what resting state fMRI in is not necessarily looking at specific response in regions during one task or another. What we're really looking at is co-variation between regions, where we want to look at how network architecture is structured. And it turns out that within individuals over time and between individuals, there's fairly reliable network architecture. So there are um, some standard networks that I already talked about a little bit, the default mode network, the dorsal attention network or the salience network. These, the salience network in particular is very important for the work that I do understanding emotional processing. Um, these regions, the dorsal anterior cingulate and the anterior insula are very important for coordinating widespread shifts in functional activation across the cortex in response to motivationally relevant information. So things like if it's morally important to you, we do things like moral decision making, but these regions also show up if people are doing speeded response times and make mistakes, air processing is very important. 
Um, it's going to check. Great. Um, so the other important thing about these functional networks is that they are relatively stable over time. Um, so there's a lot on this slide. You don't necessarily need to pay super close attention, but that these networks are stable and connectivity within and between these networks predicts cognitive performance across the lifespan. So um, in fact, this review shows that it's better to look at connectivity between these networks than to just look at specific response within a particular region. So just how individuals networks are communicating during rest, when we're not asking them to do anything, that sort of baseline network architecture can tell us about cognitive performance, where cognitive performance here is assessed with a battery of tests, whether that's uh, vocabulary response, working memory performance, uh, matrix solving. Uh, there are also a lot of specific networks. Again, going into the specifics here isn't necessarily important, but there are a lot of well-defined networks that serve relatively reliable psychological processes. So there are motor systems where primary motor cortex, primary somatosensory cortex are importantly linked at rest and the extent to which there, there are deviations from that relate to motor performance later. So we can use these resting state connectivity patterns to ask questions about how individuals who have recently had a gluten challenge or not had a gluten challenge, what kind of network shifts do we observe? So again, resting state fMRI allows us to assess communication within and between distinct networks that are associated with distinct processes. So again, going back, we want to be really specific and take advantage of the fact that we can ask these specific questions about working memory as opposed to inhibitory control, as opposed to emotional processing and being able to tease these apart. Resting state fMRI also allows us then to identify specific systems that distinguish individuals. So we can apply sort of modern machine learning techniques and say, I have a network, I know these regions are important in general, but now I wanna know which individuals look the most like other individuals and who's standing out, who's most different, and can we use that then to predict cognitive performance on subsequent tasks? And finally, we can then quantify the relationship between self-reported experiences and changes in neural network dynamics. So to summarize a little earlier, so we can have some more time for Q&A, um, functional MRI, whether that's task-based or resting state, can help us tease apart component processes and elucidate underlying mechanisms that might otherwise be opaque. We can't just use reaction time. We can't just ask people to self-report on their own experiences to be able to distinguish whether it's sensory encoding or motor initiation or attention to task or other kinds of distractors. We can kind of open up the black box and ask questions about the underlying component processes. And I think what's really exciting about a gathering like this is we can sort of like open the box and see the promise of interdisciplinary work where we can integrate from single unit levels up to cell cascades, the whole way up to these sort of um, bigger picture questions where we're looking at psychological processes using neuroscience to help inform those questions. Um, and again, as uh, Sonia, Dr. Kupfer this morning mentioned, if you are interested in the ongoing work that we're doing using neuroscience to understand brain fog and celiac disease, you can contact our lab manager. Um, that's Allie Reynolds, I'll leave that up. Um, I do see a QA. and a uh, let me see if I can respond quickly. Ah, yes, uh, so Dr. Kupfer asks, sorry, you don't need to answer because we'll have a Q&A with everybody, so. Great, good point. Thank you again. Super, um, well, this was a terrific session and we've got a lot of interest from our Q&A and um, I will kick it off for Dr. Um, Mushida, there's a, several questions and you answered a lot of these online already so thank you that's terrific but i want to bring up the issue of of eosinophils you mentioned eosinophils are very important for neuroprotection in food related disorders including celiac disease there's a great increase in eosinophils in the mucosa do you see uh, um, do you see that eosinophils when in excess in other ways other than say helminthic infections could have a role either in modifying or um, protecting the, the gut 
neuronal network. Yeah, uh, I do. I think so because the issue. I mean, what we tested is sort of a, kind of a, a parallel of your question. So we tested whether systemic delivery of IL four thirteen, um, which will mimic uh, what I know two cytokines that eosinophils can secrete. And that was sufficient uh, to, to, to induce that protective effect. So I presume like, you know, other pathologies or, you know, response that in, induce this type of activated eosinophils could do that. And in fact, not only in the gut, but this response, because it's, these are circulating cytokines that will go throughout the body, for example, we saw a lung uh, macrophage also upregulate the same arginase one if you have activated xenophils in the duodenum or if you deliver the cytokines. But we didn't test exactly what you asked. For example, uh, I imagine if you induce um, a type two response in the lung or if you induce uh, activated, you know, a mod of xenophilic uh, uh, esophagitis. Uh, that would be interesting to see. But I guess, so uh, what I don't know is if you have different types of activated eosinophils, for example, in addition for L413, other lipid mediators could be damaging the tissue instead of inducing this protective phenotype. So, you know, if we just think about the cytokines, I guess so, but uh, we have to test to answer your question, but yeah, it's an interesting hypothesis. Yeah, and a follow-up to that, and we now have agents that will basically get rid of all eosinophils, um, and that can be maintained for months or years. Um, is there any evidence either from animals where one suppresses or ablates eosinophils that you lose the capacity, for example, to protect your neurons in the context of infections? or have an effect on homeostasis of their neuronal um, architecture or, or numbers within the gut? So uh, to the first part, yes, I mean, we tested because we depleted those in the fields after the initial infection. In this case, you lose the protection. Mm -hmm. But your second part is perhaps even more interesting, which is the physiology. Uh, those in the fields are there regardless on the, tr on the trigger. And whether, for example, a constant trigger of eosinophilic depletion would induce some, you know, phenotype just by the absence of the steady state eosinophils that we haven't tested. There's, there's, for example, a mouse model, GATO1, knockout, they, they did not have eosinophils. But, uh, and, you know, these mice are fine, but they will be, they will be phenotype. For example, they will have defective cleaning helminths and other, uh, other, in terms of immune responses. But the physiology of, um, the in the gut is something that is underexplored, and some some labs are testing that, uh, and I think is a very you know it's forty percent of hematopoietic cells in the steady state. You imagine there would be some you know steady state function, but in the steady state they are not high secretors of these cytokines. So just to point this out, super. Well, thank you. Um, for Dr. Tu, if Isaac, if I can ask you, uh, there obviously is a lot of interest in CGRP. And of course, now we're giving CGRP antagonists to people with migraine as a chronic treatment. Um, and occasionally those patients have some gut upset. Are there, uh, you know, uh, his homeostatic effects of CGRP that are critical in, our, in the absence of, say, a pathogenic infection? And is upsetting that or blocking that with a CGRP antagonist potentially a, a bad thing for either gut function, nociception, et cetera, within the gut? Yeah, I think this is the implications of what we're finding that we should be very careful about long-term you know, treatments that would modulate CGRP signaling. Um, I heard a talk from uh, Viv Regev and she said that actually there's been mutations in this gene linked to colitis. So we gotta be very careful about something that I think, on the one hand, I think it's dysregulated in migraine. So, you know, it's brought a lot of relief to patients with migraine, but it could have other effects beyond uh, the, the headache aspect in terms of the gut or other places. And we know the receptor for CGRP ramp one 
is so high on goblet cells. So that's, I think the barrier protection issues will maybe arise if we chronically block this. And, and in a follow on question related to the, the really fascinating story you've brought out about you know, the CGRP mediated uh, protection from salmonella infection by basically turning down our M cells or closing them off or, or is it possible that in some circumstances that that might be a bad thing? I'm thinking about particularly during development when when children or babies are first exposed to an antigen. You know, we think tolerance is depend a little bit on the M cells taking up these. Is it possible that an infection at that time or stress at that time, for example, could cause an inappropriate reduction of M cells and then maybe prevent or inhibit a tolerance to foods? That's a great question. I think it would be great to team up with people who study, you know, adaptive immunity from development and see, in, 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 because you're right, because those are key for indu inducing IgA responses. We didn't see in our mice IgA overall levels change, but maybe antigen specific responses are, are, are dysregulated because their M cell numbers are. So I agree, I think it's always a balance. Like in some situations, you know, you need more of these M cells and in other situations it could be pathological. So um, yeah, I think in, in, it would be interesting to know in celiac disease whether you know, these pathways are dysregulated as well. So um, uh, great questions, thank you. Great. Um, I have a question for both uh, Dan and uh, Isaac before we move to Kate. Um, you have talked a lot about, if, uh, about infections and you Isaac have mentioned receptors that are, uh, can recognize microbial products. Uh, could you give us a little bit your thoughts? Because in the context of celiac disease, First of all, it's important to remember that there's heterogeneity in clinical presentations, and so not all patients are equal. But how much could you connect to, in the absence of infection, to cytokine responses and or microbial or changes in the microbiota that could be a consequence uh, to the inflammation we see in celiac disease? Do you want to go first, Daniel, or should I? If you want, you can go ahead. I okay. <laughs> yeah, so I think nociceptors, um, their main function is to sense tissue damaging products. So my, we found pathogens are one of those triggers. But I think in the absence of pathogens, there are many other things that could sensitize these neurons, in, in, in particular cytokines, actually. So it's well known that, you know, TNF, IL-1, the receptors for these uh, key cytokines that are induced during inflammation cause pain by uh, basically changing the, the ion channel physiology in the neurons so they become more sensitive. And so, um, and they also have receptors for damps and, and other things. So, so I think a sterile, you know, injury to the gut would induce the same pathways. Now, the question you asked about microbiome, that's an interesting one because I think, you know, when you do have, let's say, barrier leakiness, and we showed uh, in that, I referenced that paper that actually some got met commensal microbes can induce nociceptor activation. So when there's the opportunity for microbiome products to get to these neurons, that could also be a trigger. And um, actually Da Ping's done some experiments showing that, you know, if you just take feces and add them to the neurons, they will respond. <laughs> so there are products and they will produce CGRP. So, so there are products that that from the microbiome that could also, even in the homeostatic condition, trigger the neurons. So let's say there's dysbiosis because of celiac disease. We could potentially get more pain and more, um, you know, these symptoms like nausea, vomiting because of microbial products. Yeah, and I think this is interesting because, you know, even in gluten-free diet patients, uh, the barrier function is not perfect. And so you, you could imagine a number of consequences uh, also related to that. And, uh, and I feel that we have not been thinking enough about the nervous system as uh, you know, a potential cause uh, for those clinical symptoms. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to Isaac, I agree. I mean, in fact, one aspect of what we try to do is exactly addressing Bana's point because we, in the initial studies, we used different types of pathogens um, 
uh, including those that directly target neurons. Uh, but we focused on those that are not directly targeting neuron. Therefore, they're inducing the inflammatory mediators that we believe are the cause of the neuronal loss. So it's exactly in the direction that Isaac was saying and in, that Bana is uh, hinting to. Uh, and we have found uh, both microbiota derived, uh, we don't know what, but microbiota derived molecules that counteract this as well as inflammation derived, not directly pathogen, inflammation derived um, uh, molecules that are inducing this. So I think this goes into your question in absence of infection. Uh, for example, we don't know what are the upstream ligands of NRP6. Um, the field doesn't know. I think it's a major question that our lab would like to, to address. Uh, but also in regards to uh, what Isaac was saying, these mediators that can perform different, uh, you know, types of function in the absence of infection, which will be the case of IBD and also uh, different conditions like celiac disease. Yeah, and then just uh, to you one question, Daniel, about neuronal loss. Uh, could you imagine uh, that chronic inflammation, as you can see in celiac patients, where years and years of inflammation uh, even if you withdraw gluten-free diet, we, we know that, you know, there, there are scars that are left. Do you believe that there can be neurological scars? And could they explain some of the, uh, you know, uh, transit uh, issues with uh, intestinal transit or other things? Yeah, I mean, it, is it speculative at this point? The, in animal models, there would be, uh, there are a few models of classical, uh, you know, tissue destruction in absence of inflammation, DSS, TNBS, that people have found evidence of neuro neuronal loss. And what we saw is that this loss seemed to be, depending on the condition, seems to be long-lived in a sense that we don't see regeneration if you don't restore whatever was lost, for example, the composition of the microbiota. So uh, from the seminars today, uh, before our session, I was talking to Isaac, I mean, so many this manifestation, you know, CNS or peripheral neural manifestations of, of, of celiac disease and what Kate is also looking in terms of MRI, I guess there would be different ways that what's affecting the gut could be triggering that, but one of them could be potentially long-term loss uh, of, of neurons. And in fact, what we are trying to study in the lab now is what are the mechanisms that can induce recover recovery of these neurons um, that can, can trigger regeneration because in the gut, they can do that much more easily than uh, CNS or brain neurons, uh, but it's not known what really triggers that. So uh, mm -hmm. in terms of speculation, I would guess so. Yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. possible. Okay, and then last point, and then we'll get move to a case. Um, what about nutrients, sugars, uh, you know, uh, bacteria and metabolites, uh, because I think this is also, you, you have heard this morning about food maps. Uh, and uh, so what are your thoughts and what, you know, what, what kind of studies could help here? Maybe I could chime in just briefly. Um, nociceptors were first like spices, right? The dietary things that activate neurons were actually how these major noxious channels like trib V1 were identified. So I think there, I would be interested to know if gluten or some dietary products predispose, you know, neuronal activation or, or silencing in some way uh, that this regulates. So I think that's a really important question. Yeah, I agree. In fact, um, one of the in, the, in terms of nutrients from the diet, I think is the likely the probably the next chapter that you know mucosal monologues will go into uh, because they you know we focus a lot on on the microbiota, but for the proximal part of the intestine, uh, the impact of dietary nutrients and proteins and uh, you know derived molecules, that is it's for it's very likely more than the microbiota and is definitely understudied it's almost like a second uh, type of thing that people don't don't pay much attention but i think it's a uh, 
it's sort of the I I I I tell my lab at least that I think this is the next chapter. I think we should be focusing on that. <laughs> Joe, you want to take it from there? So I want to, um, you know, to Dr. Yoder has generated a lot of interest in his studies. There's a, a question he's already answered about psychopaths and whether they've got a different uh, response, et cetera. And he's done some very interesting work in incarcerated populations. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Dr. Yoder, you know, live to the group. Uh, I can just say, a, <clears throat> sure. Um, so yeah, I, I did answer uh, in person. The, the question was about, um, if you don't see a reaction time difference, does that mean that um, if, if psychopaths don't show a reaction time difference, does that mean they're they're more accurate under stressful situations or emotional situations? Um, and I wouldn't necessarily reach that conclusion. I think um, I tried to stress during the talk with those like specific and distinct that we can end up in trouble where we're trying to make really strong reverse inference claims based on one particular data point. And that's why I think it's really important to bring multiple sources of evidence to bear and use these interdisciplinary approaches to sort of integrate across lots of different data points to try to really carefully inform our conclusions about data that we would get. Um, um, and then there's also a question about relevance of functional MRI to panic attacks. I know a lot of our patients and a lot of patients, not just celiac patients, of course, are often um, affected by panic attacks and it can impair their quality of life. Is there any work on functional MRI that might be relevant to that? Uh, there, there definitely is some. Um, I think some of the um, sort of tricky parts about that are that if um, individuals who have panic attacks suffer from claustrophobia or their panic attacks are induced by having to hold still in a dark, loud room for a while, it can be tricky to have them actually come in and participate. And that's why we're always uh, very grateful when people are willing to come in and hold still for an hour at a time in the scanner. Um, but I, I think there's definitely opportunities um, thinking about um, the sorts of questions you would want to ask. Again, sort of we could learn a lot if someone would be willing to experience a panic attack in the scanner, but that's, that's a really big ask. Um, and not something that would necessarily have a lot of ecological validity because um, that's not often how panic attacks happen. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I suppose then as you embark on studies that involve patients with celiac disease, you've done many of these such studies, uh, how would you reassure potential participants in, in studies, for example, that involve functional MRI? Um, you know, in terms of, as you said, it's an hour in a dark room in an enclosed space. Yeah, well, that that's that. It's not even that bad. Um, that there, we use, um, we have a, a comfortable pillow. Um, I actually am not a great subject anymore because I fall asleep immediately. Um, we do everything we can to make you comfortable. There's a nice blanket. We have a headset so we communicate. Um, that's where I always train the researchers that I'm training that we keep everyone involved with what's going on, keep them up to date. Um, we have practice spaces where people can practice holding still and we build in lots of breaks. Um, so that, um, I mean, it's, if it's your first time, it can be a little surprising, but after about five minutes, everyone seems to just relax and, and go up. It's, it's not a very aversive experience. You wear headphones, so it's not that loud. Um, uh, I do see one question that's come in asking, uh, would normal resting state of a person who has often had panic attacks be different in fMRI? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. That's an empirical question. Um, I'm not sure if someone specifically addressed that, uh, but that's absolutely something that, that could be looked at. Um, and why not use open fMRI? That is another great idea. Uh, they make MRI machines that are very, very open instead of sort of a closed bore. You have lots of open space. Um, if, if you have access to one, that's wonderful. Um, they're, they're not cheap. So we sort of work with the equipment we have. So if I may ask a question, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. Hopefully Dr. Murray and Jabri, you're okay for me to oh, ask yes, this question. Go ahead. Um, so for Dr. Yoder, what about functional MRIs in pediatrics? I understand, you know, the children who are really young, but how about the Teen, and I'd love to know what the brain fMRI is in a teenager's brain. Uh, but do you see differences? Do you see something that we could potentially work on from a celiac standpoint in that arena? I, I think there are a lot of open questions. Um, so I have personally helped scan kids as young as four 
Um, so again, you you do lots of we do lots of practices. You sort of figure out your age appropriate guidelines. So for six year olds, we talk about you want to practice be a snowman, be an icicle, don't move. We don't do that with undergraduates, uh, but there are fairly stereotypical changes in morphology over time. So one of the things that 10 years ago we we had a really hard time doing is asking questions about like what does amygdala response look like in a 10 year old versus a 15 year old because their brains are different sizes and one of the things that's really important to do is make sure you normalize all of the brains to sort of a, a standard space um, but there the techniques for doing that are much better now um, so that there are custom templates for different age groups and they're relatively straightforward techniques to normalize brains so that you can look at these really big age ranges. Um, so now there are projects looking at evenly distributed from age 8 to 88. Um, I showed one of those figures looking at functional connectivity across that broad age range to look at things where we see linear changes with age. Often we see sort of nonlinear changes with age where there's big growth early in development and then it sort of levels off. But um, the, the brain's never static. Um, so I, I think there are a lot of important questions that just haven't been addressed yet. Thank you. Um, uh, that, sorry. I was just going to say, uh, there are questions about uh, macrophages, and I would leave that open to uh, Daniel or, or Isaac if you want to answer that. So basically, somebody's brought up the issue of anti-inflammatory macrophages, I presume resident macrophages in the gut, um, and what effect they could have on, the, on, or their manipulation could have on central nervous system disorders. Um, you know, a lot of MS drugs apparently could shift the the macrophage type to one that's anti-inflammatory. But but can you tell us a little bit more about the role of macrophages and how you see it interacting with with what, what you've both been seeing? Um, well, so I, I normally avoid using M1, M2, uh, which is kind of conventional immunology textbook, but we avoid because there's a, in a way, even, even more drastically than the T helper lineages, this one, for sure, you don't find a typical M2 in vivo. You don't find typical M1. So I, it's kind of confusing more than helping in my view. That's why I kind of, mm -hmm. I don't use this terminology. For example, in steady state, they are protective already. They are not triggering any, you know, tissue damage. But upon infection, they further upregulate arginase one, YM1, and other markers. So what are they in steady state? Almost M2, they, you know. So. Um, but I guess one thing that I would point to this question is that in the brain, of course, the majority of the macrophage or the myeloid cells will be microglia, uh, but there's increasing understanding of resident populations of macrophages that are in different regions, perivascular macrophages in the brain, for example, are very interesting population. And it's very likely that soluble factors such as the ones that we are describing that are circulating then across the blood brain barrier can perform some sort of polarization. So uh, it will be very difficult to distinguish um, effect of macrophages in the gut that may have in the CNS because the same effect may be happening already in the CNS. Uh, but it would be kind of, uh, I would say, speculation for me to say that if you induce uh, you know, the classical M2 polarization is IL-4, IL-13, for example, it's one of the classical, whether this would induce protective macrophages that would prevent uh, some sort of neurodegenerative diseases and inflammation in the brain. I guess, as I was saying, these factors may induce also um, tissue damage in fibrosis. So, uh, you know, it, I, I guess it's something to study, but I would say better study in trying to understand the populations, the difference of the population, how they respond to such a stimuli and the locations, for example, macrophages that are perivascular may be doing something very different than trauma macrophages and, and so on. So I'm sorry, I did not give a very you know, clear answer, but it's just because I think it's, we don't know yet. Super. Just related a little bit outside of macrophages, uh, both of you mentioned also how the gut could impact the brain, so in reverse. 
Uh, could you maybe a little bit uh, give more information on that direction? Because uh, especially in the context of brain fog, you know, that's something we are very interested in. Sure, I can take that. So I think there's um, multiple ways that the gut-brain axis works in that direction. One is the vagus nerve I mentioned briefly actually directly connects the gut to the brain. And there are reflexes that, you know, people are very excited about understanding how that affects cognitive function and anxiety and other things. Uh, so those are sensory neurons that can sense signals from the upper GI tract and then, you know, microbial metabolites and other things. Um, and in fact, uh, it's an important route potentially for pathology for neurodegenerative diseases. Like in Parkinson's, there's a thought that alpha synuclein could travel up the vagus nerve from the gut to the brain. Um, and then there's also circulating um, ways that, you know, things from the gut can get to the brain. There's interesting studies recently showing that immune cells like IgA positive plasma cells can go to the meninges and this could impact, um, you know, maybe I, uh, MS. And I think it's, so the meninge, actually we're doing studies on the meninges right now in um, and, and understanding macrophages there and neural immune crosstalk. So related to what Daniel just said, we're trying to understand that. Um, I think that that's, and then there's also circulating factors that my, my, my microbial metabolites that can cross a BBB because they're small enough and they can get through that way. So a lot of really interesting, these two organs are connected. They're directly connected by the vagus, but also circulating immune cells and factors can get into areas that could impact the brain so um. yeah i have nothing to add i think isaac highlighted the the main communicating pathways via sensory ganglia neuronal circuits which you know his lab studies uh, via soluble factors that are microbial immune or neuronal for example epithelial cells could secrete neurotransmitter that could influence circulating uh, and, of course, you have migration of cells that, as Isaac mentioned, this recent paper on IGA. So I guess these are the main ways, and all of these are likely operational in a given moment. Terrific. Um, there's a question that came in for Dr. Yoder, and it's about, is there any data on fMRI in celiac patients regarding their, their gluten-free diet adherence? For example, comparing it with the CDAT that, that Dan Leffler developed, or or any other measures? Is there is there any evidence on the use of, or any data on the use of fMRI in that circumstance? There's not that I know of. There might be. I don't. I don't currently know of of any fMRI data that specifically looks at gluten free diet adherence. Um, I mean, as I said, there's. I think there are a lot of open questions. There, there are even some low hanging fruit questions that we we should be able to get answers to relatively quickly. Um, and that's where I, I think this is the, the right time with the way the methods have developed to start getting data to address these. Um, so somebody may have, but I'm not aware of it if, if they have. So uh, you, you must have seen, uh, this is more for Isaac. Uh, so there's something particularly interesting uh, and that's why the study we are setting up in Chicago involves gluten challenge and analyzing, you know, uh, a number of factors before and after gluten challenge, uh, including functional MRI. So one of the uh, factors is this uh, release of interleukin-2, uh, but also interleukin-8 and MP1 that is, uh, was not mentioned. And that happens really between two and four hours and six hours post gluten challenge, which is the time where uh, patients have nausea, uh, vomiting, etc. So, uh, wh what do you think of that? And 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 you know, what kind of studies, if if one wanted to test the hypothesis that they were related to. Hmm, that's not, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, the science of nausea and vomiting is is a nation area. Actually, one of my good friends, Steve Liberley, is an expert on that. And um, I mentioned the vagus nerve is one path that could lead. And the other one is the area postrema, which is actually kind of a area outside the 
blood brain barrier that is key for nausea and vomiting. And I'd be curious to know if those factors you just mentioned, if there are sensors for those in the neurons that mediate nausea. Um, uh, you said that, yeah, I, I, that would be interesting to see, like mine, the databases. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do they get into the area postrema or do they yeah. activate vagus afferents? Um, if I could add, uh, Isaac, uh, you know, you brought up, I think, these, this very compelling reason why an infection could drive a response that then protects you or you get this protection later on. There. What about capsaicin? I mean, people mm -hmm. can eat a very spicy meal. Does a very spicy meal induce down, regulate your M cells and protect you from salmonella? I especially <laughs> think that when I travel to to places where spicy food is very common, maybe I should be eating it. Yeah, well, I mean, there it. has, if you look up anecdotally, spices developed in areas with a lot of pathogens and such, and they are supposedly antimicrobial. Um, but yeah, I think I think at the short run, yeah, because it will induce, We at least in my experience, when I eat spicy food, mucus is one of the things that I <laughs> experience right away, followed by GI <laughs> issues. <laughs> so I think I think at the low at the at that level, maybe these things have evolved in a way to help us, you know, maybe eating those kind of things can help. But chronically it's it's a problem, right? If those those that's not good for triggering a, a disease like IBS, that would be a you know, you would mm. avoid <laughs> capsaicin. Mm. So yeah. Um it does beg the question of whether these circuits, the pain circuits, are dysregulated in celiac disease, and um, or you know, in some way, whether it's dietary or you know, neuronal, intrinsically. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder also from Daniel's findings whether after infection uh, that predisposes to celiac disease or something like that. Yeah. It's, yeah, and, and there have been several examples of people having infection that then develop celiac disease, you know, shortly uh, after. And so you, you could very well imagine, you know, people have been thinking about barrier defects. But again, what does it mean getting a barrier defect and what's the underlying defect in that? Is this just epithelial cells or does it involve the nervous system also? So. Yeah, I mean, um, Bana, you showed um, very recently, two different models of viral infections, real virus and MNV, that break tolerance to facilitate the development of celiac disease. We have tested uh, both of these viruses, um, but I think particularly uh, we are focusing on, on MNV and we see loss of enteric neurons with MNV okay. using the same dose that you guys have used. So. I mean, maybe that could be a link on what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, that could. Uh, for Kate, uh, I was wondering, you know, people describe anxiety. You, you, I, I wanted to go back to this notion, what you are saying of functional MRI, where you can use, uh, uh, let's say, gluten challenge, where you intervene and you have a alteration versus baseline and using existing circuits. So, um, how do you see, uh, you know, using that to understand also things such as anxiety that has, has been associated with celiac disease or uh, depression or could? Sure. Um, so I, with, with anxiety, um, I think it again helps to go back to sort of like different models of anxiety where you have sort of the um, like chronic self-reflection on, on negative aspects, the rumination model of anxiety. And so then you can expect um, regions important for negative affect and regions important for like self-reflection. So those would be um, regions like amygdala, anterior cingulate, as well as default mode functioning. And so um, like a, a straightforward hypothesis would be that if we had a subset of individuals who uh, had chronic anxiety or we could you know sort of like get self-report measures of anxiety right before and after people go into the scanner and then we could correlate their self-reported level of anxiety with response in these regions during a task so whether it's um, after they make mistakes in a stroop task to what extent is their anterior cingulate overactive based on whether they were anxious beforehand or not 
or what does the network architecture look like functionally? Are there functional networks just in the resting state right after they go in? Do we see an increase or decrease with sort of the intrinsic connectivity? And I, I didn't mention this much, but there's sort of two ways you can do the, the network analysis where you can look at strength of connectivity within the network or the strength of connectivity between other networks. And so you can sort of imagine kind of a, a degradation of integrity with sort of executive function networks as people are sort of devoting more resources to um, the, the rumination that might happen if we're talking specifically about anxiety. Okay, so I think I just got a sign that uh, we had to stop here. So uh, I thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, I think this uh, just shows how much we have still to do, but I think uh, you know it also shows that Cilla disease can be a unique model because we can uh, actually control the driving antigen and the induction of inflammation. And so I think this, this could be a way for us not only to understand, uh, you know, certain things like pain, nausea, or uh, cognitive disorders in celiac disease, but I would say even beyond in humans. So uh, that uh, we should be really leveraging that disease to gain knowledge in humans. So thanks again a lot for, to everybody. And thanks a lot, Joe, for accompanying me. So... Uh, Thank you. Yes, okay, so I think uh, we are coming now to the uh, concluding remarks. <clears throat> I think that you know the, the reason uh, we organized this uh, symposium with Dr. Verma is because we uh, really felt that in the field of celiac disease, there was a need for us to start addressing this question. And the group of Jeff uh, in, in England has really already uh, brought a lot of uh, important insights in into that, but also has, uh, you know, led to a lot of questions. But also in the recent years, basic science has uh, really put forward this concept that there is a brain uh, gut axis and that uh, we start to have the means to better interrogate uh, what this axis is. So uh, I hope that today's uh, symposium has uh, elicited, you know, a lot of uh, desire for interdisciplinary research and collaborations, um, but also shows to the physicians and the patients that uh, cognitive disorders and neurological disorders, but also understanding their pain and, and functional symptoms, that uh, we are thinking about this and that there are today means uh, to address those issues. And, and, and there's so, certainly a strong interest also here at the University of Chicago. So I just, uh, because of that interest, if I can uh, just uh, share a screen and uh, uh, remind you, because I think this is important for, for me uh, to reiterate, we are going to conduct uh, a study on brain fog uh, so uh, please, if you are interested, uh, email that address. We are going to combine it with gluten challenge and an analysis of cytokines, metabolites, and the microbiome. Uh, and we are hoping, you know, in this way to, uh, you know, also further our under mechanistic understanding of uh, uh, the cognitive symptoms in uh, celiac disease. So uh, thank you again. And uh, Ritu, and, and also before I finish, I wanted to thank Rachel Lieberman for helping us organize that meeting and all the technical support we have received today because we wouldn't be able to do that without them. Uh, and again, many thanks to you, Rachel. Dr. Verma, do you have anything to share before I close out and give final instructions? No, I'm just very thankful um, to everyone, the, our participants. It's been a wonderful, wonderful day. Um, of course, Dr. Jabri and I are totally committed to looking at celiac disease on many levels. Um, and we, know, we don't know a lot. We know something, but we would hope that we're going to continue on. But keep bringing in the questions. Um, Rachel has helped us significantly with all this, putting it together, meeting achievement, and also Tom from the CME office. So thank you. And back to you, Rachel. Fantastic. Well, thank you. I want to thank once again, our speakers and Dr. Verma and Dr. Jabri, I think bringing together these experts from around the world is so important. Um, and hopefully we'll further work in the future and research.
Um, I just want to, if you are looking for information on how to claim your CME credit, I just want you to refer you back to that um, web page and up in the corner that CME and tech support, you'll find all the information there. I just want to thank everyone again and remind you that all videos will be posted in about three days on that same website. So for educational purposes, you can refer back and we will have all videos posted. So thank you again to everyone for sharing your day with us and we hope you have a wonderful holiday season.